Welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody on this beautiful spring morning in New York. I I hope it's a beautiful uh, time, probably not morning, where, where you are. <clears throat> um, and um, I'm... <laughs> I'm very pleased to present part two of the mystery of the other. I got really into this and then I thought maybe next week, um, if possible, I might present part three, the mystery of the others and um, group as a special window into the mystery of the other. And before we actually start today, I want to um, ask you, so you can think about it during the, the session, um, there's, I'm, I'm doing a class, a module on facilitating groups every other Thursday. We'll meet this Thursday for the second time. And this module has six sessions. If anybody wants to join late, you, you can and, and listen to the, um, the first one on video, but as a part of that course in facilitating groups, everybody will have a small group that they'll facilitate from three to six sessions. And we would like um, some volunteers to be in a small group that would meet um, for three to six sessions. Uh, commitment of three sessions, we should say. And if you're willing, it will be on Zoom. Put your name in the chat and um, and we are going to set up some practice groups that will be practicing facilitation. So uh, one of the members of the class will be the facilitator of your small group that will meet um, three or four sessions five or six if you want. Okay, so that announcement I wanted to make sure um, to make. And now we're gonna start all over again, shall we? The mystery of the other, part two. And last week, we sort of embodied this mystery by looking at the faces of the other and our own face because we are the other also to ourselves. So let's just do that for a moment. Come back to where we were last week since this is part two. And just Take in, feast, feast on the mystery of the other. It's actually the mystery and challenge of the other, right? The other can be the greatest challenge and the, and the greatest joy. But I'm hoping that the word mystery sort of envelops both of those things. And now let's just take a stretch together I find that so helpful. <sighs> a breath and a stretch. So as we stretch our bodies, we're hoping to stretch our minds and our spirits because we're all one thing, of course. And our bodies aren't just our physical bodies. So we have this amazing life mystery of the other. But what do we do with it? What do you do with a mystery? You look at it, you listen to it, you study it. You let it touch you, you let it embrace you. 
You breathe it in. Right? You relax into it, even if that mystery is a challenge. But also, or and also, you speak to it. You engage with it. In the focusing world, we're always talking about listening. And I, I think I did a few different reflections on listening. And the topic of listening is one of my very favorites. It just goes to the core so much. But we never talk about speaking, do we? Do we speak? Do we talk about speaking? Not very much. So... Benu is shaking her head. Yes, we don't talk about speaking enough, right, Benu? But, you know, we are always speaking. You are speaking right now. Right? Your face is speaking. Your spirit is speaking. Your energy is speaking. Your thoughts are not just inside your head in a skull. Your thoughts are in the air, in the environment. Your thoughts are speaking. And we are imbibing your thoughts, your feelings, your spirit, how you are today, where you are. We are always speaking. And so today we're going to talk about some different dimensions of speaking. Um, you know that line from the poem, The Rain. Um, <clears throat> you probably know it by heart now because I, I often quote it. The, the line is, there are hands placed on my shoulders. What has been spoken to me? How does my life reply how does my life respond and our lives are responding to the great mystery of life and that response is a speaking so um we're going to talk about uh i think there are five dimensions of speaking uh the First one um, <clears throat> is speaking up. Speaking up, what I mean by it, and you may mean different things, and, and I'd love to hear what, what you mean by these things, but speaking up means uh, that the speaking is happening in you. Jane says it has to come. And you are letting it out, you're speaking up. You're not keeping it inside. I mean, you never can keep it inside anyway, as we were saying, right? It's always, it's always in the environment. But you let it be out there. The speaking out. And just take a moment to write down any image or metaphor or draw something about speaking out. The second one, speaking from. And we know about this in focusing. We know <laughs> it's wonderful when we can speak from, right? It's there in us, can we speak from the felt sense? Speaking out, you could just be making noise. You could just be getting something off your chest. You could just be um, chatting, right? There's nothing wrong with any of those things, but speaking from, is very special. 
it it is here in us in its implicit form and then speaking from is a very sophisticated delicate complex amazing process where we take this implicit um world of felt sense and we transform it into symbols we take it from this um, amalgam in us that is unsymbolized, metaphoric, non-rational, non-logical, feelingful, and we bring it into a kind of linear form into language where we can express it to others. Of course, the others get this implicit also. And when we're listening, we want to listen to the explicit and the implicit. But often it takes a kind of translation when we're speaking from. It comes, it comes out, and then often we have to say, well, I don't mean that exactly, I mean this, or the word I want is such and such. Sometimes, or many times, when we're speaking from, something can come in its very raw form. Um, I said when I came back that that is the trouble with speaking from in its raw form, that you blow the circuits. You, I blew your minds. I blew your circuits. And that we have to translate. And if we translate from um, what the hell are you doing to, oh, uh, I'm feeling very frustrated right now. It doesn't blow the circuits. And it says it um, from a place that uh, that can be heard. But when we do speak from in a raw form, then we can translate it afterwards. So we can say something in a raw form and then we can say, oh, what I mean is blah, blah, blah. Sometimes we have to listen before we do that. Okay, number three is, is speaking out. And it's sort of like speaking up, but speaking out to me is when... <clears throat> It's difficult. It's like coming out, speaking out. A friend of mine and I talk about peeping. And, and that's like, you know, when, when it's very delicate to say something, either maybe it's delicate personally and we feel vulnerable, maybe we're hurt by somebody. Uh, uh, and we want to say, oh, I really feel, felt hurt when you invited so-and-so and you didn't invite me or uh, when you said that my peeping, uh, speaking, um, speaking out, or maybe in a situation where somebody is politically insensitive or... Um, and we want to speak out about that. Uh, and we have to find a way. There's something very particular about finding a way to speak out. So let me give you a moment to digest that. And now the fourth one <clears throat> is speaking for. Speaking for is like 
a true democracy in a way. It's not only giving my personal self a voice, which is very important, but also speaking for those that don't have a voice. Maybe speaking for um, somebody has their their dog on too tight a leash and the dog is choking. Maybe I'm speaking to the owner for that dog. Oh, I think your your dog is needing attention or something like that. Speaking for all of the people for whatever reason, many, many, many people that don't have a voice and we're speaking for them, speaking for the planet that's being um that's being uh mutilated in some ways speaking for and the last one <clears throat> is the most important one that we know the least about this one that is in Dean's paper, fitting in, pouring out and relating. This one that is an evolutionary step that may save the species or not. This one is speaking to, in our public arena, we have so little of that. Right? We've talked about that. We don't speak to each other. We can speak out and we can speak for and we can speak up many times. Sometimes we can't. But speaking to is very rare. When I speak to the other, I'm referencing that other in my body, in myself. My, my colleague, Michael Eigen, um, who is a, a therapist, a theorizer, <laughs> talks about when he writes about his patients. He talks about my inner so-and-so. And I love that. I use that also. But we all have an inner so-and-so. We have an inner planet that we may speak to. We have an we have an inner um last time when we talked about the people we we don't like or we hate, we have an inner uh, those people, of course. And speaking to is speaking and listening at the same time. Listening and speaking are one system, one unit. And when we're speaking to the others, we're speaking with this interaction first we are one interaction and right now i'm speaking to you and when i look at you it makes a big difference when i really look at you when i'm not just thinking about what i want to say to you but i'm thinking about what I want to say to you. <laughs> it's very different. Can can you feel it? In, yeah. yeah? What I want to say to you. Now, if you're nervous giving a presentation or something like that, it's probably because you're thinking about what how you're going to come across what you want to say. And a secret that I learned as a young woman was 
if I think not about how I'm going to come across, but I think what I want to say to you, what I want you to get, it makes a complete difference. Let's just try that for a minute, just for fun. We're just playing because we won't really hear each other. But think of something that you want to say to the group. Um, and we're all going to say it at the same time. Okay, I'm going to say one, two, three. And we're all going to say something at the same time as we're looking at each other and we're speaking to this group. Okay, one, two, three. Hello, everybody. I enjoy learning. Hello, you all have such oh, great yes. faces. Oh, I love all yes. your time to be here. Yes. Yes. Me too. Yes. yes. All this companionship. <laughs> I went to a, a church in uh, in South Africa. Um, and it it was uh it was a little pentecostal church and it was a wonderful experience and the way that we prayed in that church was that everybody would walk around and they would talk to god out loud and everybody was in their own prayer so it sort of reminds me of that they were mm -hmm. all talking to the great mystery and to, and of course, the others are in that great mystery. Mm -hmm. So speaking to is a very, very different thing. When we're in trouble in communication, which happens so often, and the trouble might not just be conflict, it could be boredom. It could be just being trapped in a way that we communicate that you can't get out of. A way that we can reset is to think uh, of the pause of, uh, and the way Brother David Stendhal Rast puts this um, is fun. He talks about it being like crossing the street, the way we teach children to cross the street. Stop, look, and then go. And sometimes we can we can stop when when we when the communication isn't happening and look at how what we're saying to each other and then go after we've felt into that to speak right to the other person in what that person can hear. And what Jean says in this article, that Susan Dysroth loves this article and talks about it a lot. So I think it's her article. But um, what uh, he says is that you can speak only what the person can hear and then stop and say, well, what did what did you hear me say to you, right? And then the person will say, um, I heard you say, uh, I never do any housework and the burden is all on you. And then you say again, oh, I wasn't saying that. I was saying it would make such a difference to me if you made the bed in the morning. Oh, uh, what did you hear that time? <laughs> and then, but that's very hard to do. I think this is what Jean thinks is an evolutionary step of speaking to and speaking only what that person can hear. In the language that that person can hear it. So, politically, that's so important because all of the political factions, not I think only in the US, 
have their own language. And if you use the language of your faction to somebody in a different faction, you weren't speaking to them. You have to use language that that person can hear. And you have to hear them enough to have an inner them so you can know the language they can hear. So I'm not going to go into that right now. But uh, uh, I'd love to hear whatever comes to you about all of these five ways of speaking. And then we're going to, to see um, in our breakout rooms how we can play with them. Lynn, is, is <clears throat> speaking to the same as speaking with? Oh, I forgot speaking with, didn't I? I think yeah. speaking with is after. Thank you so much. I have to put speaking with in there. After you speak to, then the other person is responding. And then you get to this wonderful place where you're speaking with, right? That would be my association. But of course, I'm making all of this up. <laughs> I, I love that the speaking with let's put it down what is your association to speaking with Mary well it's sort of a, a, a heartfelt back and forth you know it's yeah in in the whole body focusing we talk about heartfelt conversation and that's what that's what it feels like yeah yeah. Sensing from what has been spoken before, responding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, beautiful. <clears throat> You're doing this reflection with me, and and I'm sh sure all of you will be with me in this. There's a there's a sort of made up word sometimes used in practice communities called withnessing. Oh, yes, yes. Well, and that, that heartfelt level of, you know, being with. Yes, yeah. yes, I love that, withnessing. Beautiful. We're going to add that in here, too. There's a definition of connection that seems to fit here. Um, this is from an NBC instructor, Dr. Cindy Bigby, but she describes connection as... Um, the flow and ease that occurs between two people when they each feel they each are, um, feel seen and heard and valued without judgment. So there's that ease. To me, that's the the with the uh, speaking with and the um, I love that withnessing. That was good. Yes. 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 Uh, Stuart or Lynn, could you say a couple more sentences about listen, uh, witnessing? I just witnessing. Yeah, ah, I love it. You have a, a bit of a. You have to have a bit of a lisp to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I could say more. What inspired that? You know, little quip from me. Well, the wit, the witness. Like if we talk about witnessing in a legal sense there's this objectivity that is clear and precise and accurate. And I'm really into that, like phenomenologically, what is actually happening, right? And then as, as Marianne said, there's something when there's, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, right? There's trust, there's shared, there's some, you know, there's a level of trust that's sufficient when uh, there's a relaxation and the suspension of judgment. And what Lynn was saying about, you know, we're seeing the other person out there, but then we're feeling them in here. And that that's a really sophisticated level of perception to actually reconcile those and kind of dissolve one's countertransference projections, et cetera. Right? And so witnessing is like someone who's already on that level 
of just being with. It usually, in my experience, and the context that comes for me is in a practice community where we've been doing dyad, triad, group practices for <laughs> many, many times. So the level of withnessing is possible. But, and, and it's something we can hold as a possibility, like what Lynn, what you're saying. It's an evolutionary stage. We don't just get there just by thinking about it. As we practice, we can develop that capacity. We can we can uh, start um, start with the two pound weight, and then we can work our <laughs> way up to the <laughs> to talking to our families, for example, or something that might be the the fifty pound weight. But I wanted to say to 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 uh, Marianne and 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 also to you, Stuart. Um, what I'd what I'd like to believe is that we don't have to have it all together. You know, maybe you have judgments, maybe you have trans uh, counter transference projections. Of course, we do. We always do. We say it, and we say we think we're saying one thing. And we're really not saying that. We're saying this other thing that's in our counter-transference projections or something. And um, then the then we listen, and the other person can say, "Well, what?" Uh, it sounds like you're you were uh, disgusted with me, or it sounds like you you don't think I'm very smart, or whatever it is. And then you can say, "Oh." Uh, how how did I say that? You know, it's like this openness to your own. Of course, you know. Of course, you're you're going to have judgments. Um, we're going to have a a a video on uh, that will be public on uh, on my channel from our uh, community empowerment project um, uh, about uh trying to communicate or or navigate speaking to each other uh when we're when we have all these projections <laughs> so i'll i'll let you know when that's up so we're we're at the place of the um of the uh the speaking up and just anything that's there in you it's asking to be spoken. And it's like, you're letting it be spoken. Um, I'm letting myself speak up. Um, and I kind of um, wondering who I'm speaking to um, and where I'm speaking from. And I suppose that's where um, it's the context of uh, commitment to intimacy and friendship and the protocols that are within that, you know, so, um, and yes, uh, I'm all of those aspects, or I, I have a face for all of them, in that I can turn up as a, 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 a well, I suppose I can turn up, I, I do turn up any way I am, but what is alive in me is private, in that I won't share it, there's no need to share it, or there's no, because then I'm being spoken to, you know, being spoken to rather than is being a, a, and that's fine. And lots of times, you know, we, we just take our positions and we're one of the, uh, you know, that it's not all about the individual, you know, so it, I don't want it ever to be all about me. But within that, then there's the potential for really delicious, intimate conversations with friends that have committed. And I suppose I'm going for the, the 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 real ones that become intimate and become you know uh, I suppose love love based you know so I suppose that's it you know so uh, yeah uh, I think it's a political position in some way but but I don't know what that means I mean I'm saying it the word political but I'm actually not sure where the value of speaking out becomes. Uh, translated into a power I suppose that's it you know it's not just uh, you know uh, uh, 
yeah, that the individual becomes um, seen. So anyway, we're muffling, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm trusting. So. No, you're, I, you're I, yeah. I feel you not only speaking out, but speaking up, right? You're speaking up for, um, let's see if I understand that. Um, that whole complex thing that when you're speaking to those who've committed themselves to intimacy, it's a different kind of speaking from than when you're speaking um, up or speaking for in a political sense, meaning that you want your voice to be heard as a, as an influence. You want to be an influencer in your speaking. And that has a different feel for you. Is, is that right? Uh, I think some of it's right. And I think this is the, 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 the kind of, um, uh, the value of focusing in that there's protocols, you know, I become a listener, we divide the time, and there's boundaries in that, whether it's a paid process or not, you know, that's a different, you know, that's a different value, you know. Um, but the realness when I'm real, it's when that there's a trust uh, established, where there's boundaries established, you know. The, uh, the rest is, uh, I, I don't know what the rest is, you know, when I show up, when those aren't in place, then I don't know what I'm actually signing in for. So yeah, it it the complexity I think is in the relationship. You know the 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 personal. It's in the personal. You know rather than uh, anything else. And I don't know where they define the political and the personal. You know, I can have opinions and I can have power to vote, but uh, but it's not personal. It's not you know unless I become a politician. So, yeah, so thank you. I'm sure others have uh, <laughs> yes, al alive in them too. Yes. Yes. There's so many kinds of speaking from, aren't there? And you're saying that when there are protocols, like focusing partnership is a protocol or psychotherapy is a protocol, that... Um, that there is a kind of uh, uh, speaking from that is, uh, what can we say, less raw, it's more direct, it's more risk-taking, it's more vulnerable, it's more intimate. Is that right? Yeah, I'm hearing all of that. And, and, and every one of us, you know, I believe, uh, kind of form opinions. And then it's like, well, then it's the, well, then I'm interested. Well, what do you think? If if there's time, you know, if but it's it's that, that there's something about determining or understanding the measure of the relationship, you know. Something... Otherwise, it, yeah, sorry, go on, Lynn. But yeah. no, you know, you were just about to say it. It's something about understanding the measure of the relationship, you know, who I turn up as, you know, that. Um, understanding the measure of the yes. relationship. Yeah. I think that's what, that's the last couple of words were, otherwise it's theoretical, it's someone's opinion. And I think journalists says, if it's in the in library, we don't need it. Uh, I love it. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. So thank we you. Were, yeah. We were doing that process just sort of naturally um, of, of listening and then speaking and, um, and, and there's a particular thing that, um, uh, that the measure of the relationship is sort of a term that you made. Mm -hmm that says something it's like it and what i get from it let's see if this is right is i measure the relationship how safe is it how close is it what is my purpose here 
um, what am I, what are we trying to do? What are we doing together? I measure all of that in, in the speaking from, and it's very helpful if there are protocols or commitments or something that we can sort of rest in there. Did, did I have that right, Pauline? I think there are, um I think that the it's a, a common sense, you know, that when I don't understand a measure of relationship, I'm expecting something from someone that they might or might not give to me. So my common sense is, you know, I know the difference between a trustworthy conversation or a, a French a communication, um, a committed communication. Um it doesn't mean that the other person isn't trustworthy, but we just don't have anything set up, you know. So I think it's to generalize is missing the complexity. But we know that comments, we know that in our in our uh, relationships anyway. We know that. Yes, 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 yes. We know that instinctively. Yes. That when when um when I'm say, talking to my child, it's going to be different than when I'm talking to my partner, and that's going to be different than when I'm talking to you in a reflection, when I'm talking to my neighbor, right? There yes. is that common sense two-ness, uh, right? That was yes. speaking to, yeah. uh, and that because we are this one interaction, it's not just I'm part of the in, I'm speaking <laughs> I'm part of the interaction. Mm -hmm. Did anybody else pick up any other nuance of what Pauline was saying that I didn't pick up? As Pauline was speaking not just to me but to all of us. Roberta had her hand up. Then um, yes, and everyone. Um, I love what you just said, um, Pauline. It really broke it down in so many different ways. And I started experiencing the sense of um, some of what you said about um, how I'm actually either trusting or not trusting something within the context of the communication. And what I'm personally trying to do in my life is to... Um, not be thinking about um, that that trust factor anymore, um, uh, because I think it's on me to cultivate the relationship and to cultivate the communication. And when I say cultivate, I basically imagine a field that is a bunch of rocks and stones and a, whatever else is going on, and I'm trying to I'm trying to pull them out and plant seeds of of happiness <laughs> or some, that. you know plant plant some other kind of seeds than the ones that haven't grown so well there before mm. so there's there's something about um wanting for my life for the rest of my life and for all of our lives um that not so much focusing on the other and instead focusing on the way I speak to myself and the way I want to be spoken to. Mm -hmm. And if I can, you know, shift that in some way from the way I was grown, <laughs> the way I learned, the way life sometimes happens, um, I think I'll be uh, feeling better. I mm -hmm. think my felt sense of who I am and who everyone else is is when we really slow it all down, as you as you all know. So, mm. real that's, volume. that's beautiful, very inspiring. I it it occurs to me that in all of the speaking, um, when we're translating into words, there's a an element of risk. Can I risk? Let me take a little risk here. Uh, and then and then see what happens and that's what i what i hear you saying roberta that you want to risk more by um speaking from 
and it isn't i think the division that we that we had in the 60s and 70s of uh authentic or not authentic a true sen a true self or a false self it's more complicated than 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 that of course um but how much or how personal or how uh how untranslated can it be and can i take a little risk and can i speak from what's there even when we don't have a language in common i don't mean um necessarily uh uh international language but i mean uh a lang a cultural language in common can i still speak from but maybe use different words that will be speaking to the other and then something is is a risk there and we're cultivating we're trying to take this evolutionary step did did i get the essence of of what you were saying roberta you, you asked and, and you said more um and, and now my thought is is when we're talking about an evolutionary step in the year 2023 um i'm thinking about why is this a risk where is the risk you know what what is the uh was there some deep fear that has intervened along the evolutionary process that we've all kind of acquired a sense of like, I can't really say this, but if I say this, I'm going to really get, you know, what's going to happen if I say this and, or feel this or open to this, or then where, where will we go? Where will we be? You know, so I, I'm always, I, I'm a risk taker um, as best I know how. And I'm just, I, I'm just constantly hoping that we can move quickly um, sooner than, 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 because, you know, like they say, it's a minute before midnight. So. Uh, yes. It's a minute before midnight. Yes. It's or less, I think at this yes. point. Yes, yes, yes. And it's, and it's interesting to, Think about why it's so difficult, but it's even. Um, I think what Jean says in that paper, and uh, Christine, maybe you could put that paper in the um, in the chat. The fitting in, pouring out, and relating. What he says is that we that that uh, we've already taken many evolutionary steps in terms of taking it for granted that we that we have an individuality that we have thoughts that our opinions count uh that we would speak just from our roles in the past and i remember that in the 50s mostly you know and people just spoke from their roles um and that we are we are now trying to speak from our persons that are connected to all the other persons and that each of us has a, a part of the whole of all of us that's living and uh and the challenge of saying what we have and each one of us has a different take on the universe that it, it's needed for all of our opinions so that's new and then it becomes very delicate because everybody is getting really scared. He said, they said, uh, they're, they're against abortion. Oh, blah, 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 blah. And you never get to know what that person is against or this person um, is an atheist and oh no, or what does that mean? We don't know what that means. But, but that risk of, of saying, and Jean says that the only true conversation is when there's room to ask the person, what do you mean by that? Or can you say more about that? Rather than reacting, the, the responding rather than reacting. 
Well, I want to give you time uh, in your breakout rooms. So uh, let's uh, have three in a room and just talk about this evolutionary step and what it would mean for you in your own life to take that step. We'll have 15 minutes. Welcome back. Hi, Lynn. Hi. 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 So um, is Banu here? She told me we left out. There you are speaking at, right? <laughs> you want to put speaking at there. Oh, speaking at, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And and uh, I think we all know what it's like to be spoken at, <laughs> right? <laughs> the feeling of the feeling of being spoken at. Hmm. So, what happened in your breakout rooms? How was it? I, I think what was really wonderful about uh, the group. I mean, and I was with Steph. Um, was how much resonance I felt with everything that was said before, mm. like from everything you talked about, Lynn, what Roberta offered, what Pauline offered. It was just like this, this amazing uh, field that was kind of um, like incredibly resonating. Everything that was said that. I was able to absorb just came out in a new uh, form uh, for my experience. And uh, yeah, it, something really wonderful about it. Oh, it, it sounds like the speaking with, right? That you got there right away. And usually it takes a process. And maybe you could think about what enabled you all to do that, the speaking with? Well, Steph was the first one sharing and the story that she shared was such a clear example of what do we do to make this next evolutionary step? Mm -hmm. What can we do? And it talked, of, it talked of the probability and the possibility of leaving certain things behind mm. things having to do with judgments that come to mouth before you even think uh -huh. you have them um, opinions assumptions expectations and kind of uh, rediscover you know who you are anew without all of that if you just put it you know in the yeah. in the storage room we decided the storage room was a good place uh -huh. for all of that <laughs> I I love that. Thank you. It, we should do a a a help the helpers on on what we have to leave behind to take the next <laughs> evolutionary step. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Wow. I love that. That's a wonderful topic. This is Sophie here. We have we had a great breakup room. And it was what you just said, what we leave behind, I think maybe also what we want to include more of. And we were talking about mm, different things, but one of the things we were speaking about <laughs> is I don't know the one. Um uh, is to cultivate, um, and maybe others can pinch in also to to that that we, this conversation was intellectual in some way. And is there a way we can bring in the in the conversation something more concrete or maybe earthy or a cultivating of? Hmm um that in the conversation mm -hmm. and it made me think about um i think it's the exercise we did in this group last time where we were trying to 
be with someone we may not, right? We may not appreciate. And a lot of us went to Trump, right? And I'm one of one of them. And in the breakout room, what I came to was like, oh, there is a certain, I, I started to open up to soften. There is a certain simplicity that it seems like he is speaking about or coming from. And yes, it's the mystery of living is complicated, but is there a way that we can also um, come to this simplicity fabric? Something, and maybe then we would include also more concreteness, or maybe people who are also cultivating or, or in the earth, or I don't know. So, yeah. yeah. I'd love to hear Steph's story <laughs> as a concrete want... example, Sophie. Yes. I oh, just it... want to say back to, to Sophie that something about uh, including uh, a simplicity or concreteness when you're speaking. <laughs> and I would love to hear Steph's story also. Well, I'll give a short synopsis because I want to hear other people as well. And I think we're almost out of time. Um, I had a lot of work in my house. I had to have a contractor in my home over many months. And we were really dependent on each other um, because he needed the money and I needed the help. But he had wild ideas about life and he was very defensive about them. And he came in with these really wild things. And we, because we had this need to be together, I had to, I really felt judgment, but I didn't display it in the way I was speaking to him. But then at some point in the relationship, I dropped the judgment. And I think he sensed that. And then we were able to start having real conversation about things and, you know, more from that feeling sense of, of why he felt what he felt. And then I was able to then trust him to be able to share why I felt what I felt. And this is because the relationship went on for many months. You know, it wasn't like a one and done thing. We had this long-term relationship. And that's what I shared with um, Marga. And Mar then Margo beautifully said about putting the judgments in the uh, storage room. She <laughs> brought that one up. But yeah, that's the that's the that's the basis of the story. But it was the first time I'd had that experience with an, another person with that those strong things, you know, about guns and all these things that I'm like, whoa! <laughs> uh, but I but I dropped that internally, mm. and I wanted to hear and asked him questions and wanted to understand why he felt the way he did, and I think that developed the trust the trust and I think trust is the is the thing yes 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 mm -hmm. trust uh, as my colleague says trust is the glue that holds the self together and you slowly develop that it was sort of like an arranged marriage where you where you <laughs> but in a way on this planet now a minute before midnight we have an arranged marriage with everybody um, yeah. I think I the think important thing was that we needed each other. I think we, and we don't remember that we need each other. We forget. Yes, that. yes, yes, yes. That's, that's, yeah. We need each other. Okay. So, um, we're going to have our poem and, uh, uh, I'll meet with the planning committee for just a, a minute or so after our meeting. And if you're willing to be in a Zoom group uh, to practice groupness um, for three sessions, uh, please put your name in the chat and we'll connect with you about when that will be. And, um, and um, this this has been wonderful. I wish we I always wish we had more time. So uh Dorothy, let's have our poem. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Um this poem is in the chat. Thank you, Christine. 
And it's um, The Centaur by um, Miller Oberman. Um, okay, and he's an American poet. First they call me it, and then ignorant of how people use this word, they mashed up the meager nouns they had for gender and called me the goy and said to me and said to not be one or the other was to be nothing. I ate the grass it was shoved in, knelt at salt licks. It took the barbs and kicks and crushed them into fur and leather, oiled and burnished, it made those halves into one galloping body, horse and rider. The centaur endured the second, the school day, cruel gray rag, filth stiffened. The boys and girls who fit so easily into in their costumes look like stick figures, crude and two-dimensional. Dante already knew, it read later, in the inferno, in the seventh circle of hell, centaurs guard the river Plegathon, one of Hades' five rivers. Plegathon, river of fire, river of boiling blood, which boils forever the souls who commit violence against their neighbors. Centaurs guard the edges, shooting arrows at any of these sinners who try to move to the shallows. When sometimes I wish I'd had a boyhood, I remember those days instead. My four muscled legs. I was seven feet tall then, riding myself, carrying myself. A centaur is never lonely. Mm. Yes, wow. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>